everyone to the first uh, RCSI Global Surgery Grand Rounds of 2022. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm the chair of Global Surgery here at RCSI, and I am really pleased uh, to welcome our two presenters uh, today, both from RCSI, um, I, talking about team building in surgery. Um, people I, I know well and respect uh, well. First uh, speaking is Professor Walter Epic, who is the chair of RCSI SIM, the Center for Simulation, Education, and Research. Prior to coming to RCSI, he was the director of the Feinberg Academy of Medical Educators and faculty development for the Department of Medical Education. Excuse me, he uses qualitative research methodologies to study the contribution of conversation to learning for individuals and for teams. Professor Marie Morris uh, spent the first half of her career working in acute and critical care uh, nursing as a clinical nurse specialist in London. Following that, she uh, went back to school um, and got a master's degree in clinical medicine, focusing on communication skills, and then a PhD in surgical education. She now leads uh, the one-year full-time master's degree in surgical science and practice here at RCSI. Uh, Professor Epic, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, uh, and to Deirdre for organizing this session. And I'm very excited to be spending this time with you today with Dr. Marie Morris, a dear colleague and collaborator. Uh, and one thing I will take the liberty to do is also add to my bio is that I am a physician. I'm a pediatric emergency doctor, and I spent nearly 20 years in clinical practice, most of that in the emergency department, working very closely with physicians and, and health professions from a variety of specialties and disciplines, including with surgeons who are probably one of the closest collaborators to support children with a whole host of congenital anomalies, other acquired surgical conditions, trauma, and the like. And I'm very excited to be here to think about what will it take to provide better and, and safer surgical care? And I think one of our answers to this is working better together. And I know many of you may be joining from any location around the world where um, the type of simulation that we engage in here at RCSI may not be immediately accessible to you. And that the things that we're discussing today are really independent of technology. And they're more about mindset and um, approaches irrespective of where you might be working. So hopefully we'll plant some seeds and, and offer some, uh, some inspiration for you. Um, by way of disclosures, I have a number of things to share and I'm just gonna give you a second to review this this slide and also highlight that RCI SIM is thankfully a CAE Center of Excellence and we receive an unrestricted grant to support our educational and research activities. So what are our objectives for our time together today? Our hope, Marie and I hope that you'll be better able to outline how team communication not only helps or hinders surgical patient care, but also learning that you'll be able to explain how collaborative intentionality will promote collective competence. And we, of course, will define these terms for you so that you have a clear understanding about what they are. And last but not least, I'm gonna introduce the term in team inclusiveness and perhaps inspire you to apply these principles to your own uh, surgical practice. <clears throat> so I think it's not lost on any of you that team communication is a huge part of modern healthcare irrespective of where we work. We don't work in silos. We work in a team and it is that, that, that team approach that enables us to provide the types of outcomes that we seek in, in, in modern medicine. The one thing I'd like to argue for today though, that not only is team communication important for patient care, but it's how we learn. Um, senior surgeons uh, teaching junior surgeons, in an explicit fashion, but also the type of things that happen just as part of daily practice, whether it's in the operating theater, in the emergency department, or on the ward, or in the outpatient clinic. All of our interactions with people within our profession and across professional boundaries contribute to how we learn in healthcare, both when we're in training and, of course, across the span of our professional lives. This is actually one of the hallmarks of interprofessional education, which is learning with, from, and about each other. We learn with each other about how to manage certain situations. We learn from each other, things that we can't learn 
from people within our own professions. And then of course, we learn how people in other professions work so that we can actually engage in the patient care that's our main aim and our collective ambition. It's been widely documented that communi communication breakdowns occur frequently and threaten patient care. So we know that when we don't communicate, bad things happen in hospitals, no matter where we're practicing surgery or medicine. This has been well documented in the Institutes of Medicine report and any other um, a publication. What I'd like to argue for right now though, is that not only does patient care break down, learning breaks down. So if we aren't communicating effectively, patients suffer and that's our priority. But of course we are not learning and the people who are, we are charged to train aren't learning either. So when we look at this image, you see um, uh, school children who are enthusiastic about chiming in, wanting to learn, wanting to speak their mind, ask their question. And this is something you all will recognize if you have small children um, or work with children. They just, they can't help themselves. And yet, through the course of our lives, this, this desire to share and speak up without concern what, what, what may come is somehow beat out of us. And so this, this image here encapsulates the issue, which is we are, we are uh, socialized to speak only when we're sure or not, never to reveal weakness in many instances. I think that's changing a little bit, um, but that still is a huge issue. And the problem then leads to um, barriers for speaking up. I'm not an expert in speaking up, although I did have a, uh, an occasion to review the literature in preparing this, this article, um, which was focused in the emergency department, but actually has applicability across any domain within a healthcare practice in any, anywhere in the, in, in the hospital, including in surgery. So speaking up really is about giving voice to concerns and uh, choosing voice over silence. And I think this is one of the things that really makes speaking up or the lack of speaking up as a communication failure distinctly different from others. Because when we choose not to speak up, namely to withhold what our concern or what our idea might be, we're doing so in full awareness that, that it's happening. We're actively choosing silence over voice. So we, we are socialized to not speak up or to limit our speaking up because of things that we see in our workplaces. Disruptive behavior, people being treated badly, getting yelled at. Um, we witness rudeness. It, 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 there's a whole body of literature. You can check out work by Christine Pearson or Christine Porath or Rona Flynn about the cognitive impacts of watching a rude interaction with other people that you may not even be a party to, but all that does is it trains us <clears throat> to remain silent unless we're 100% sure of what we're going to say. And of course, in healthcare, we know we rely on people to speak up with their questions or concerns to help us avoid making mistakes that can actually lead to patient harm. And then of course, there's this very classic form of teaching, which is known as pimping. And pimping is really a lot of <clears throat> rapid fire, <clears throat> excuse me, rapid fire questions to get at someone's knowledge deficits for the purposes of education. But what it actually does is it shows in front of a, a, a group on rounds, for example, the ward round, that they don't know something. And it makes people feel deeply uncomfortable. And I've heard arguments to say, well, that's how people learn. But you know what? It trains people to remain silent, if at all possible, to avoid showing weakness. And that, again, limits speaking up. One of the things that's vitally important to encourage speaking up and voice behavior is something Amy Edmondson talks about as psychological safety. And Amy Edmondson is a professor of management at the Harvard Business School. And uh, she really latched on to this idea of team psychological safety, which very simply is a belief that you will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. And that it's a space where interpersonal risk-taking is possible. By the way, I'm not advocating, nor does Amy Edmondson advocate, wrapping people in cotton 
and making them feel comfortable. That's not what this is about. This is about creating a space for people to be comfortable being uncomfortable, to, to voice out concerns and um, really take a risk to say, I don't know, I'm not sure, can we check on this? And it's no mystery to a group of surgeons that bad things happen to patients, wrong side surgery, um, heart transplants, where the heart is from a patient with an incompatible blood type. And it, when people do root cause analyses, often it's discovered that there were people in the room who were perhaps questioning or wondering, but did not give voice to their concerns. So this is not a touchy feely aspect. This is something that's vitally important. Safety is not a word. Safety is really a feeling that you have that enables you to say, hey, listen, I'm not sure about this. Can we just pause for one quick second? So one way to overcome these problems of speaking up has been to introduce SBAR. And this may be something you're using in your local context, wherever you might be, you know, situation, background, assessment, response. And that has some merit, um, which is great, but it is not enough. It is simply not enough because not only is it a matter of speaking up, it is a matter of listening up. People need to be open to the fact that they may be wrong and need to be inviting input. And uh, Lorelai Lingard and Brian Hodges who are two very esteemed uh, health professions educators really talked about competence, which is really what medical education, health professions education is all about. And Lorelai shares three wisdoms in her excellent book chapter that she's since built on. But this is about not competence as an individual, but competence as a collective. And she notes, competent individuals can still form incompetent teams. That means the brightest, the best of the brightest come together, but yet they still don't get the outcomes that the patient deserves. Individuals may perform competently in one team, but not in another, which means there's something about the collective that enables people to bring their full skills to bear. And then of course, one incompetent mem a member of a team can impair one team, but not another, which means some teams have the capacity to, to smooth out issues. So there's something higher than the individual practitioner. So of course, the opposite is not only uh, uh, bad for patients, but it's because the team is collectively incompetent. So as I said already, you can be the best and the brightest, have the highest test scores, the best surgical skills or skills in pediatrics, and yet it's all about the team. So how we talk to each other and how we work together matters, and it's actually fundamental to how we make sure patients get the safe care they require. So this is about our interactions and how we, we actually think about how we're interacting with our colleagues. So here's a child who has a life-threatening condition. You can imagine this is a, an infant who was in a car accident, who has suffered traumatic brain injury and is brought into a, your clinic, your hospital, your emergency department, who's barely breathing and requires urgent intervention to save his or her life. And of course, it's not only about saving his or her life, it's about giving this child a chance to reach his or her full potential. So just by way of a bit of background before I transition to, to Marie, one of the barriers of actually speaking with people, particularly in other professions is that we are socialized to be a member of a specific group. And I'll just point to something that's known as social identity theory. And all that says is that it's about which group do you belong to and who are the cool kids? And I wanna be one of the cool kids. Um, for example, I'm a physician, Maria's a nurse, or I'm a, I'm a consultant physician, Mar uh, Mark is a, a trainee physician. So it's, it's all these different ways we view the in-group and we are the cool kids. And the problem is when we are in an in-group, we view people in the out-group, the others, as somehow less than we are. And that means they may be lazy, they may be not motivated, they may be less smart, they don't do it as well as we do. And 
what that does is it amplifies group boundaries. And this group boundaries, you could also view as a little bit like an obstacle because we need to be crossing boundaries in order to have safe patient care. Emergency doctors need to speak with surgeons, nurses need to speak with physicians, ICU doctors need to be speaking with other specialties, et cetera, et cetera. Jenny Weller, who's an anesthetist from Auckland, New Zealand, talks about tribalism. And it's really about how we, we develop and are socialized to belong to our group. And we actually develop a, an identity that's quite powerful. And what it does is it, it creates an us versus them mentality. And it is this us versus them mentality that gets in the way of communication, of teamwork of collaboration and of speaking up. It's a huge, huge problem in healthcare. Renee Stahlmeier, a dear colleague from Maastricht and Laura Varpio wrote this really elegant paper talking about um, challenging intra-professional work-based norm, work uh, education norms. And this essentially says, Surgeons teaching surgeons, doctors teaching doctors, nurses teaching nurses, in complete disregard from the fact that sometimes a nurse may be the best positioned person to teach a physician some aspect along their trajectory of becoming a surgeon, a pediatrician, an emergency physician. So we need to do more working across professional boundaries. When that paper came out, I was so taken by it that I, I wrote the editor of the journal Medical Education, said, I'd love to write a commentary. And the editor, Kevin Eva, said, you'll go for that. And so Marie and I did some thinking and Marie and I published this, this paper about what will it take to change these workplace-based educational norms, which by the way, pervade clinical practice around the world. And we believe that's through collaborative intentionality. And that's a term that has been used very in the original form by both Engstrom and Bleakley. And it really is about working together, not in a happenstance way, but intentionally, deliberately, thoughtfully, so that there's a deliberate connectedness and thoughtful collaboration. And we realize that a little bit about what we're speaking about is a pie in the sky, so to speak, an ideal to strive for. And yet, what we'd like to do for the remainder of our talk is give concrete examples of how we can bring these, these ideas to life. Marie's gonna give some lovely examples from her educational work, and I will share some additional principles from my uh, clinical practice and, and research program that hopefully can give you some very concrete strategies about what you can do tomorrow to sort of level the playing field and begin promoting these collaborations. Um, what I would invite you to do, if, it just ask you just to get us thinking. If you're a physician, what have you learned from someone in another health profession? For example, a nurse or a physical or occupational therapist, or if you're a nurse, what have you learned from a physician? So irrespective of what your clinical background is, what is something you learned from a different professional group? And if I could invite Mark maybe to just have a, uh, an eye in the chat box to see what people are saying. Um, I'll stop sharing my slides whilst we monitor the chat box. If there's anything popping up. Um, I'll just cast an eye. Not quite yet. Not quite yet. So if you have answers to Professor Epic's question of what you may have learned from somebody outside of your own profession, outside of your own tribe, uh, please pop them in. Kieran O'Driscoll writes different empathy. Different empathy. Yeah, that's that's sort of an interesting thing because people from different professions have a almost unique take on things and point our attention to, to aspects of what constitutes empathy that, that other providers may not even be aware of. So thank you. But so what I'm going to do is I think in part this was a question to, to get your input. Families hold a lot of information. That's wonderful. Normal delivery from a midwife, that's a great example, right? Thank you, professionalism. Hi, Kahal, thank you, Professor Kelly. Key to a successful start is having the insight to listen to wise nurses. That's, uh, 
yeah, that's what hopefully people don't learn that from the school of hard knocks, but that's one of the wisest things. So this is exactly what we're speaking about. And I think uh, Kahal, your, 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 your comment is, will be a great segue to Marie in a moment. Um, treat patients as human beings first and as, and as a patient second. Thank you so much, Renee. So John writes, an, an, a nurse taught him wound care in the 1970s when he was an intern. And a CRNA taught him to place an LMA in Nigeria. Yes, those sort of things. I know I, will, I learned sterile technique from a nurse in a surgical clinic, uh, and it was the best lesson I ever learned. Anesthesiologists have taught you to call for help early. Thank you so much. So these are lovely examples. Um, tons about ostomy care for nurses, right? Things you would never learn from other physicians. You know, I'd love to turn it over to Marie now, who's going to pick up on some of these ideas and amplify them uh, from her own educational experience. Uh, Marie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Walter, and good afternoon, everybody. Delighted to join you here this afternoon. Um, so just to follow on from, from Walter, so often with a lot of the examples for crossing boundaries, and in health professions, education is very theoretical um, without any practical application. So we wanted to actually have concrete examples of how this collaborative intentionality can be implemented into health professions education. Um, you know, so within that, we had four suggestions that we could identify explicit interprofessional learning moments as they occur within simulation-based education and highlight those particular moments that, that occurred well or areas that were missed, which would foster team inclusiveness, and that we could actually formalize the boundary crossing structures so that senior nurses could intuitively lead junior doctors and junior doctors would feel psychologically safe to actually ask for help and to admit where there was a query that they weren't sure of the answer, so that as a team, that uh, the patient would remain safer because there was a number of disciplines um, minding the patient. And also that we would embed these boundary crossing behaviors within simulation-based education so they became the norm. Just so just to give a background, so um, as, as mentioned, I trained as a nurse originally. So my sort of lens coming to health professions education comes very much from a nursing background, which in essence makes me a sort of cross-professional educator. Um, I teach, I have taught undergraduate medicine and I now teach postgraduate surgery. Um, which obviously not my primary degree, but um, the benefit I feel is bringing a different lens to the to the educational experience and um, to promote this uh, collaborative intentionality, sort of deliberate engagement and fostering of, of relationships that don't happen necessarily organically. Um, so the Master's in Surgical Science of Practice, as, as Mark mentioned earlier, is a one year full time master's. Um, it's the first of its kind. It's introduced, designed, written, and um, vi the vision was by Professor Oscar Trainer, who's um, Professor of Postgrad Surgical Education. It's a one week, one year, uh, over a week, students in essence attend a virtual um, hospital. So we create the sort of year one intern SHO post in the, sa in the psychologically safe environment of simulation in, in number 26 York Street here in Dublin. Um, the, the participants are all generally early medical graduates with an interest in surgery. Um, and we run simulated ward rounds, simulated nights on call, outpatient clinics, journal club, um, obviously surgical technical skills, surgical forum, case-based discussions, so that they're in essence undertaking the role of a junior doctor in a safe environment within number 26. Um, and so... Um, they, they've actually today is, is the day after their first simulated night on call, which they just had last night. So the idea really with the cross professional um, impulse is to move away from the stymied approach of doctors training doctors and nurses training nurses, and also to promote the psychologically safe environment such that doctors and nurses can speak up and act as they would authentically in clinical practice, which sometimes can be quite stymied within um, simulation based education. So the under those of you with an interest in the, the educational component, so obviously they're, they're learning completely in situ in a simulated hospital set up as close as possible um, with simulated patients, nurses from their areas of, of expertise, physio students attend pharmacy, 
students attend and obviously our masters in surgical science and practice um experiential learning because it's all doing this program is simulation based so it's very much undertaking the roles uh, rather than talking about what they would do they actually have to actually do it um, and reflection on action we use the CAE learning space um, platform so everything's recorded so that the students can go back and review I review the students videos um, and write comments with regards to the communication skills aspect we have our resident rather than consultant of the week he's a consultant of the year with us Mr Simon McGowan um, so that the students can go back and learn um, from the review of their videos and we can um, highlight explicit moments of interprofessional practice evidence of cross professional crossing professional boundaries to improve patient safety and outcomes so that we can do that retrospective as well with their videos. So again, my area of interest always in research right through from my early career has always been the transition from a junior doctor to a hospital employee and that that's often baptism by fire a point where suddenly you go from a final year medical student to the bleep holder on a night on call or on a hospital ward and it can be a very very stressful situation for junior doctors so the whole remit of this program is to prepare doctors better um, which will obviously hopefully help long term with stress and burnout and some of the higher order skills are quite difficult to attain in general um, surgical training or practice out on the ward area so one of the things that we really wanted to do with the simulated night on call was to create a sense of isolation and um, create a sense of uh, the reality of being alone at 2 a.m you know with patients deteriorating in a hospital setting and having a consultant at home should you wish to to discuss it but also deliberately intentionally cultivating the relationship and the working team effort with the nurse in the room that may well in the emergency room be more experienced than the doctor is and or the surgical ward so decision making is one of the things that we look at prioritization deciding the order of review of the patient they've got to manage the uncertainty and the complexity there are um, patients who have deteriorated as inpatients there are patients in the emergency room to be reviewed um, they obviously have to communicate uh, with the, both the patient and or relatives and the nurse and negotiate um, management plans and the the timely escalation is essential that's often a, a skill that they really struggle with is, is when to actually escalate so these are all um, the the learning outcomes that we that we look for so we basically want the the masters and surgical students uh, to collaborate to deliberately and um, with intention to collaborate with the nurse to um, in order to cultivate this interprofessional engagement to really consciously try and build that relationship and to cross boundaries that would be traditional where they may feel they have to ask another doctor the answer that they can actually ask the nurse with the wealth of experience in the room um, what their thoughts are you know share their thoughts this is what they're thinking and um, get some feedback on that so again as we know it's learn the interprofessional component is learning with from and about each other so what we've really found is they often don't know a lot about each other as in certainly in the more advanced nursing roles such as advanced nurse practitioners and clinical nurse specialists the there's a fudging of the traditional um, boundaries of where medicine stops and say nursing starts and so a lot of advanced nurse practitioners um, are experts and a huge resource to junior doctors but they're sometimes they're not as aware of what the actual various disciplines capabilities are and so one of the things that's part of this program to the interprofessional component is le actually learning about each other so they can be appropriate in in cultivating these intentional relationships so the thing that makes it very different to a lot of simulation based education is that we do not stymie the nurse we do not tightly script the nurse such that the learning outcomes of, of the doctors or surgeons are are mess um, we the nurses participate completely and utterly organically as they would on a ward or in an emergency room at that time. So um, they, their remit really is if this was your junior doctor on the ward today or tonight, um, as an intern or, or a year one SHO, act and interact the way you would if that was your actual doctor. And so that they can do that. And so the cases that the guys and girls had to, to do, and that it actually they were on call last night. So um, we walked the walk 
with them and, and uh, talk the talk. So we've done our night on call last night, followed by a ward round this morning. So um, we feel their fatigue. So we're giving them uh, some authentic practice. So they get a day four post-op patient with chest pain, urosepsis, a chest trauma and post-op confusion are what last night's teams had to manage. And so really interestingly then from the feedback, um, from the doctor's perspective, um, from a fidelity perspective, they found that they felt very isolated and they felt alone, they felt scared um, because the building was so quiet and scary and eerie, which is, you know, anyone that's worked in a hospital late at night knows that's exactly what it feels like. Um, they were really surprised by the level of expertise of the nurses and they weren't aware of that level they found when they did deliberately collaborate, share their thoughts out loud, have a discussion about whether they would or wouldn't they place a chest strain or they would or wouldn't remove a urinary catheter, that there was a discussion, a collaboration, and that, that you know, where a different view was given, they often felt they were saved by the nurse, that, that the nurse saves them from doing something that they would have done routinely um, that they shouldn't have done. So that, that was really, really quite interesting. And they felt very supported um, and less scared and, and more alone. And also, interestingly, they felt confident to escalate to a consultant. Um, so the nurses would often share, you know, the, the other doctors would actually ring the consultant about this. And so they felt, oh, OK, that gives me the confidence to phone my consultant. So that was really quite insightful. And then from the nurse's perspective, um, you know, they felt that they do really support junior doctors. It can be really professionally compromising to be stymied into a very tight script um, in simulation where they can't authentically be themselves and show their skill sets and, and do what they would naturally do. Um, you know, they often find that they do acknowledge sometimes they may come across errors and they're able to support the junior doctor with that error. They appreciate that it can feel very vulnerable to be a junior doctor alone at night and also be very vulnerable um, feeding on from, from what Walter was saying earlier. If the, you know, if the style of the, the consultation that evening or the following morning is this pimping style of, you know, almost naming and shaming and, and publicly humiliating the students in front of the patient and the whole ward team. It can be very destructive and really push away from speaking up. So they really felt that they appreciate that, but also by building trust, by intentionally collaborating and, and fostering a relationship together to manage the patient, they felt, the doctors felt more able to be vulnerable and seek that help um, and so that they and fundamentally the bottom line for everybody within any health profession is obviously patient safety so um, back to like really two heads are better than one so that was really good um, from that perspective that the, the nurses felt you know that they could be authentic and do what they would organically do um, in a hospital. So really in conclusion what we've we've done really and, and aimed to do with with our sort of teaching interventions is to reconceptualize into professional and um, simulation based education to really push early on and I think this needs to go back even further into the undergraduate training you know often into professional education is espoused um, and the various disciplines might sit near each other in a lecture theater um, you know because there's a lecture on on musculoskeletal exams so you might have doctors nurses physios uh, in the room, but there's not really any intentional collaboration or any intentional boundary crossing. It's, um, it's, it's very much espoused. We really want it to be deliberate. We want to sow the seeds early to go out and deliberately work and well foster team engagement um, so that patient safety remains paramount. Um, to promote crossing traditional boundaries to, you know, to quest you know seek out senior help as a junior doctor and also for nurses to support junior doctors um, where they may traditionally not have and like I say the, the whole point of it is, is uh, for all of us is patient safety and then from the nursing perspective by reconceptualizing papal nurses can actually intuitively lead and do what they would do uh, and always have done and to a very high standard um, and so that's, you know, that's something that can most easily be brought into simulation based education and that they would cross the traditional boundaries. And as I say, with the advanced nurse practitioner roles, those boundaries are getting um, less concrete. And obviously within that, we have um, the team inclusiveness. Thank you so much. I'll hand back just now to Walter. <laughs> Uh, 
Thank you so much, Marie. You know, it's always so inspiring to listen to you describe the innovative work that you're doing. And just to give a sense, um, you know, in my journey, journeys across uh, the simulation world, so to speak, very often what we do is we put junior doctors or medical students into a simulated environment because we're keen for them to demonstrate their knowledge. They may be in someone who is portraying a nurse role who might actually be a nurse, but somehow the nurses are briefed not to help because we wanna see what the doctor knows. And so this is an example of the type of negative learning that actually is entrenching these siloed approaches to healthcare. And Marie, your, your work is so innovative and I can't wait for us to write this up and uh, to, to share it with the broader community beyond this, this talk today. So I'm just gonna share my screen again and, and, and continue on along. And just for Mark, who's, who's listening in the background, it's gonna be about another 10 minutes. So how might we then put our hands together and what will it take for us to communicate better together? And what I'd like to do in about 10 minutes that I have left um, with Marie is to reflect with you how we could actually bring this to life. What are things that you can do in your clinical practice tomorrow that will help bring these ideas to life? And so this is really about moving from them to us and bridging these group boundaries and something that Jan Schmutz and I call team inclusiveness. And Jan is a work and organizational psychologist from Zurich, uh, ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. And we've been working together for about the past seven, six or seven years, really developing these ideas that I'm gonna to present to you now. By the way, this is also building on a lot of uh, work and is complementary to a lot of work that's going on at RCSI with Eva Doherty, uh, Oscar Trainer, and a whole team working on issues of human factors and how we work better together. So there's, there's a lot of synergies here. So how do we put the pieces together? How do we put the knowledge and skill pieces together so that there's a, a whole, a collective whole? And I'm gonna to touch on three main areas. First is inclusive leadership. Second is inclusive leader language. And third is team reflection. And these are perhaps on the one hand lofty ideas, but they embody actually quite practical and um, easy to understand strategies to bring these ideas to life. The first of which is inclusive leadership. And this is uh, something that Amy Edmondson, who is the one who talked about psychological safety that I presented earlier, really introduced. And inclusive leadership is a leadership style that invites and appreciates others' contributions. And I know that sometimes this may be easier said than done. So it's not my way or the highway. It's, this is what I think. Marie, what do you think? Or Marie, this is what I'm thinking. What other contributions might you have? Or when Marie comes and says, Walter, I'm not sure about this maybe we could try this, that I value that contribution. That doesn't mean that I need to immediately do what Marie is suggesting, but I need to at least be appreciative. So rather than saying, Marie, that doesn't make sense in this situation, I might say, you know, Marie, that is less likely in this situation. Why don't we put it on the back burner for the minute and focus on things that might be more likely. So inclusive leadership. Second, inclusive leader language, which is actually quite related. So Mona Weiss uh, and Michele Kolber from Switzerland did this elegant simulation-based study where they looked at speaking up behaviors, again, giving voice to your concerns, um, and they looked at two different conditions. The first of which was the use of explicit invitations to outgroup members. That means that a physician team leader would explicitly invite the nurse to uh, for ideas and suggestions, such as, um, Marie, what other suggestions do you have? And in for in-group members, what they found was that when leaders used words like we, us, our, that in-group members were also more likely to engage in speaking up um, or voice behaviors. And so what, how does that look? What does that look like? So rather than saying, Mark, what are you going to do about this? Or Mark, what is your next step? It's, Mark, what are we going to do about this? And Mark, what is our next step? And this may sound very subtle, but again, here in this empiric study published in a pretty good, a pretty good journal, um, they were able to show that these very subtle changes in how we speak have huge implications for voice behavior and speaking up, which I've already highlighted 
is necessary for patient safety. And then the third principle I'd like to share with you is one of team reflection, or also known as team reflexivity, which is really a team's capacity to reflect together on their goals, strategies, processes, and, uh, and um, outcomes in order to improve current and future performance and adapt. And by the way, adaptation in my mind as an educationalist is also about learning because when you adapt for the future, that means you've learned something. So uh, Jan and I have been working on this topic for a number of years and we continue to do so. And I'd like to explain a little bit more about what, what, what we've done here. So you'll see up at the top, there's a schematic of a patient who's uh, receiving care or about to receive care. And there are three time points before this patient care episode, during the patient care episode, and after the patient care episode. And one of the first things Jan and I did was to think about team reflexivity and what that meant or the way it had been portrayed in the literature. And it was actually reflecting on events after they occurred. And uh, for those of you who, who may know some of my work, I'm really interested in debriefing. That's sort of my big thing, reflecting on what happened and how to get better and learn from that event. But what Jan and I did is we, we thought about these reflective processes and how they actually apply to other time points as well. So think about uh, a moment of reflection or we call it pre-action TR beforehand. So what would be an example of that? So let's think for a moment, you're in your clinic or in your hospital setting and the radio goes or you get a, a call from paramedics. They're bringing in a 15 year old patient who was in a car accident at very high speed, slamming into a telephone pole and that they will arrive in 10 minutes. This pre-action moment, this huddle would be the time you use to prepare yourselves for what you will require to care for this patient in terms of getting ready for the task work, the, the, the interventions you might require, the resources you need, and also how you might work together. And then of course, there are these in-action team reflection moments, namely those reflective processes that might happen during patient care, um, which are very brief, of course, but that can also be quite helpful. And for some of you may know about the principle of 10 for 10, which is 10 seconds for 10 minutes, so you take 10 seconds, let's regroup quickly so that we are organized and are working for the next 10 minutes. And the goal of all three of these processes, which is why we've united them under the umbrella of team reflection is shared mental models and adaptation. And as I've already highlighted, that is learning. So I'd like to take a deeper dive into this in action team reflection, which could also be uh, represented in sort of a routine surgical case that then goes pear-shaped for whatever reason, because there's suddenly massive blood loss and the patient is very unstable. And this is exactly the type of situation in which this, these team reflective processes are valuable, which is dynamic and ever-changing situation where the information is constantly changing. So we're not talking about routine events, we're talking about acute events where there's lots of stuff happening. So think about the coordination that needs to happen when someone has massive blood loss between surgery, between anesthesiology, between the other professions who are in the operating theater. And what we're speaking about is those brief moments when you're recapping, summarizing, inviting input and planning for next steps. So what would the recapping and summarizing look like? And this may be something you're engaging with. Hey guys, let's review what we've done so far. Let's review where we are right now. Our blood pressure is this, we've given this much fluid, we've given blood, this is where we're at. Um, or we could invite, let's recap to make sure we're on the same page. Now, of course, this could be something the leader does or one of the leaders in the room, but also someone else could trigger this. Maybe there's a, um, a, a more junior physician who says, hey, can we review where we are so right now? A nurse could chime in to this point, or could we get a recap? Because very often when things are rapidly changing, people lose track of what exactly the thinking is because very often we think inside our head and we don't voice our thoughts. So this is about making your thinking transparent. And importantly, it's also about inviting input. What do you think? What could we be missing in this situation? What else could be going on? What other ideas or suggestions do you have? 
And again, this is not about uh, signaling, I don't know what to do, but it's signaling, I'm open for input. It is an embodiment of this inclusive leadership that I highlighted earlier. So we did a, a, an empiric study uh, in a simulation environment um, where we could control for various factors. And we were able to demonstrate that in teams who engaged in these inaction team reflection behaviors, recapping, summarizing, inviting input, they had demonstrated improved clinical performance, especially when the teams were larger. So again, think about those trauma resuscitations, those large um, uh, surgical uh, events where there are lots of people in the room, these type of short moments can get everyone on the same page. Just uh, last year, we published in a behavioral observation system that focused on how we might measure these inaction team reflection behaviors that are really focused around seeking information, evaluating information, and planning for next steps. Currently, I'm working with some pediatric emergency, uh, pediatric emergency and pediatric critical care doctors to really focus on these huddles that occur before patient care episodes. And we're doing this in pre-arrival scenarios. So, of course, in both critical care and emergency medicine, you get notification, hey, the patient's coming, they'll be here soon. And, and what does that time look like when people can get ready for what to expect? So this is in, in process, but initial results are quite quite interesting. And then, of course, debriefing, which we're, we're not going to take a deeper dive into, but that really is sitting down after the fact, reflecting on what you did, and uh, learning from those moments. Um, and it could be after a, a challenging operating uh, situation, it could be after a trauma resuscitation, any kind of, uh, of situation. What was working? What, did, what do we need to do better next time? And, and, and what are we taking away from this that'll help us improve? So all of these ideas that we've been discussing today are in many ways a drop of water on the surface of a pond. And what we'd like to do is create an environment where even little things have ripple effects across the surface, so to speak, that create uh, a space for people to chime in, to help people speak up, to share their concerns so that we can take better care of our patients. So in summary, team communication enhances both performance and learning. Psychological safety enables and is vital for critical conversations that are essential for safe patient care. And collaborative intentionality promotes collective competence and tangible behaviors can foster team inclusiveness, as I've highlighted, such as inclusive leadership, and inclusive leader language as well as team reflection. And again, Marie and I are ever so grateful to Mark and the Institute for Global Surgery. And we're uh, uh, happy to take questions. And um, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Marie. That was a that was a stunning presentation. Really, really important stuff that you're talking about. Uh, we've got <clears throat> nine minutes or so uh, for questions. So if you all have any questions in the audience, please feel free to pop them uh, in the Q and A box. Um, well, I'm going to say, you know, my first uh, my first rotation as an intern back in the 1800s uh, was uh, in the ICU, and I had no idea what I was doing. Honestly, my first overnight call, I had no idea what I was doing, and I did nothing to help the patients. The nurses kept the patients alive and basically told me what to do. Um, this question is probably not going to surprise you coming from me, um, but there is a group of people critical to this conversation that y'all didn't mention a lot of, um, and that is patience, uh, and how much can the patient voice come in. And I say this also, Walter, you and I are both Americans, and we know that in the US at least, the primary driver of lawsuits is not outcomes, it's communication. Uh, so I'd, I'd love your thoughts about that. You know, that's, that's a, a lovely question, Mark. And certainly these ideas that we've been presenting are not mutually exclusive to including patients. They're actually enable us to include the patient voice. And I would say in my, my clinical practice in the pediatric emergency department, uh, when we would have a critically ill child, when we did not know what was going on, the type of thing where the triage nurse brings the child back and it's like, here we are, and there's this limp child who's gray and looks very ill, um, we would be recapping and summarizing and mom, what other suggestions, or in particular, 
with children who would be very unwell, who would um, you know, have very medically savvy parents because the children had been in and out of hospitals all their lives because they had a number of congenital anomalies or the like, and it would be routine. Let's recap, let's summarize. This is what we're gonna do. Mom, what else would you add to this? Um, I know you've been through this before. What could we be forgetting? Absolutely, I'm like full on board with what you're saying. And I've lived that and I've sought that input and it had been saved because mom will be like, usually what they also do is they do this too. Or there's this one special test they always remember. I can't remember what it's called. It must be in the chart, right? And then I can dispatch someone to go and find out what that additional test is. Let's say a child has a metabolic condition or the like. Um, um, or, you know, multiple issues. And they're like, well, actually the surgeons are always here too. And you're like, ah, okay, great. Let's call the surgeons too. Um, so Marie, I see you nodding too. Yeah, and I just think as well, um, <clears throat> within the, the Masters in Surgical Science and Practice, like we have a fantastic um, group cohort of simulated patients. So all of the waterans and the Knights and Color patient-centered, as in our patients are trained in advance and they're active participants in, in the actual ward rounds. And they, again, organically can ask any question that they want of the team. And, and one of the sort of learning outcomes that I would observe for on their videos is that they very much realize, you know, that they're, it's the patient's condition and it's the patient's illness and that they're supporting the patient because they have a body of expert knowledge. But fundamentally, it's the patient's choice as to how that's managed. And so the, pa the, the patient aspect, I suppose it's because it's so central, maybe we didn't mention it, but it's absolutely core to the whole training that they, that they, you know, that the whole illness belongs to the patient and the team come together with their various discipline, knowledge, expertise to support that patient to make an informed choice. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um... Uh, are either of you, Walter or Marie, familiar with the Non-Technical Skills and Surgery Initiative, Steve Ewell, Robert Riviello, and others? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. TARP has a question about that in the, in the Q&A box. Yeah, I mean, he noted a couple as well. Maybe, Marie, you could, you could go. Yeah, so, I mean, all the, the whole underpinning, so of, of the MSSP, the Masters, uh, one whole module, which is which is um, the module lead, is, is and, uh, Dr. Angela O'D, who leads that module um, with them. With, um, of, uh, Professor Eva Doherty and the whole non-technical aspect and uh, situational awareness, leadership, safe patient care, safe surgery checklists, all of the, as you say, absolutely, Mark, like it's very rare that surgeons make technical mistakes. Uh, the technical component is very well trained. It's very well audited. It's very well assessed. So the breakdown generally is in communication skills somewhere along the line or loss of situational awareness or error fixation, uh, you know, confirmation bias. So all of that component is core uh, within the training program as well. It's, it's, it's up there absolutely alongside the, um, the, the technical skills. And we also use professional actors um, to act out some of those sort of more challenging um, scenarios of error disclosure um, consent um, and various aspects like that. So yeah, the knots and, and all of the um, human factors component is, is a very large part of the ward round and the sim and all the simulated component of this program. So I'm just reading Angela. Angela, good to, good to read you. Um, I, 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 you pose this lovely question, this lovely rhetorical question, why do we not take greater advantage of this opportunity for learning that we have? And it's a great point. And I think this is one of the main things that um, Marie and I are advocating for and that I was advocating for with the team reflection and the debriefing and really just taking a moment, you know, uh, people in, in, in the military or in um, aviation, they do these things by routine, they debrief quickly or after action review. Um, and it's vitally important. I'm actually involved in a, in a study with a, a psychologist colleague from Switzerland, Jan, who I mentioned before, we're actually meeting in an hour to discuss a project that we have ongoing that is all about debriefing in clinical environments. Um, and it's really this, it's these quick learning oriented conversations that we can do to take advantage of the, the, the work that we're doing every single day. I think one of the, the, the barriers is that we think the debriefing has to be this major event that takes an hour when you could do a quick debriefing in five minutes. 
And by the way, Marie and I are going to debrief after this because we we practice what we preach. And I believe my colleague Claire Mohall, Dr. Claire Mohall, will be on the on the call. And we we pre-brief before we have meet, important meetings. We debrief after them. Like the, this is just a way we can we can operate, and we can do this in healthcare too if we make time for it. Um, it could be after an individual patient care episode. It could be after a shift. Um, it, it depends on on. Um, on um, just making it a culture, right? A culture of, of debriefing and reflection and, and learning. Really, it's a clinical workplace culture, learning culture question. Um, so thank you for the question, um, Angela. Great, I, I actually echo right here what Angela just said. It was very interesting, very thought-provoking session. Thank you to the both of you uh, for being a part of this. Uh, Next month, um, we will not have a Global Surgery Grand Rounds because we will be preparing for the first annual Dublin meeting in patient-centered global surgery, which will be on the 15th and 16th. Uh, if you're on the mailing list for this, you will have gotten and or will get, and probably both, uh, reminders and flyers about this. We would love to see you there. Uh, Walter, Marie, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, and thank you, Marie. All the best to you all.